Hi, everyone. Welcome back to the Gen Z Up to the Ballot podcast. I'm your host, Sullivan Beach, and today I am joined by guests Evan Schneider and Nick Meldrum. Guys, how are you feeling today? I'm feeling pretty good. Uh, I'm glad to be on here. Uh, how about you, Nick? Yeah, I'm feeling fine. Doing uh, good. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, I know. Uh, so Nick, he actually was sick uh, earlier last night, so I, we weren't sure if he was going to show up here today, but we're glad that he's in here. And guys, the first question I would like to ask, and also I would like to add that this podcast, it's basically a little bit about what we're all feeling post-election, what, what, what's the atmosphere like around campus. So the first question I would like to ask you guys is, how do you guys both feel about the election, just the results in general? Evan, I'll start with you. Um, you know, I, I'll be honest, I was a little surprised with how the election went. Obviously, you know, that was not what I was expecting. Um, but as far as like uh, how things are feeling, I would say just consensus from what I've seen. I mean, I guess it probably depends on like where you were at. I mean, back closer to where I'm from, I'm sure it's much different than here. Um, but I think I've just noticed kind of how, how polarizing um, politics are in general. I feel like it's how it's been really in every election that I remember. Obviously, I'm not old enough to really remember like the 2008, 2012 elections, but very polarizing. I mean, you just you could ask one person and they would say, oh, I love the results. You ask another person and they hated them. So, I, you know, well, let me ask you this. Do you think that it's more more polarizing now because we have a guy like Trump, who's like one of the most polarizing figures we've we've ever seen as the president? Do you think that's part of it or do you think that that really doesn't have that much to do with it? I, I definitely think that does have something to do with it. I think he is less of a politician than uh, our previous presidential candidates. And I think, you know, some people absolutely hate that and some people absolutely love that. And I think that definitely has become very polarizing to a lot of voters, I would say. Yeah. All right. So, Nick, I'll ask you the same question I asked him and I'll ask you to um, do you think that Trump, because he was so polarizing, do you think that kind of connected with young people more than like a Barack Obama or like a George Bush who are a little bit more professional? Yeah, I I'd, I'd definitely say that he sort of connected with like just the average American a lot more because I don't know, I think at this point people are kind of sick of seeing just politicians and kind of not knowing really what their values and morals are. Like a lot of people are just kind of tired of hearing the same kind of buzzwords at, at a political debate or whatever, and then not really seeing any change. So in the sense of being able to connect with uh, just average Americans, let alone like younger people, I think Trump ha is definitely just different and it kind of helps him stick out a lot more than other candidates. Right. Okay. Yeah, I can definitely see that. And then uh, the other, another uh, second question I would like to ask you guys is, so basically, I don't know if you guys know this, but there was 8 million new Gen Z voters for this election. I think the other number um, for the last election, it was like 41, or uh, that totals now with the new 8 million Gen Z voters into 41 million new voters. So like obviously in 2020, were you guys able to vote in 2020? 41, 41 no? total. Yeah, 41 million. Not, 41, not 41 million 41 total million voters total. in Gen Z, right? Yeah, okay. in Gen okay. Z. So I don't know. Were you guys able to vote in 2020 or no? Because I wasn't. I was, I was 17. I was, I was not. Also, I, was I was not also. able to vote in you 2020. Weren't. I was okay. also 17. Because you're the old. Or no, wait. I, I don't know who the I'm the oldest of us three. Yeah. I, I was about two months too young yeah. to vote. And yeah, I was like pretty like close to being able to vote. And I remember I was super frustrated <laughs> that I wasn't able to vote. But I wanted to ask you guys, do you, and Evan, I'll start with you, do you think that um, the 8 million new Gen Z voters had a large effect on the outcome of the, of the election? Um, you know, I, I think that's kind of a, a, I mean, that is an interesting question. I, I, they obviously definitely had an impact. I mean, 8 million is a lot. I mean, obviously the election was, even by popular vote, decided by less than 8 million, especially when you look at the swing states. Um, as far as, like, I'll be honest, I don't know the exact statistics on, like, how Gen Z voted percentage-wise, but I, I do think a lot of the numbers, the more important numbers to look at would be like specifically swing states, how Gen Z voters voted. I think Trump did pretty well in the swing states with Gen Z voters, and that definitely helped him uh, get over the 270 mark. Yeah, and then kind of going off that, I don't know what both you guys think about this. Um, obviously, Nick, you can respond to that, but do you think that RFK handing some of his votes over to Trump and basically endorsing him had a big poll too because RFK kind of seemed to have like 
had a large appeal to young people, especially young men. Do you think that kind of had an effect on how things went? And then, Nick, also, do you think that the 8 million new Gen Z voters had an effect? Um, I, I'm kind of like Evan. I don't, I don't really know the statistics of the 8 million new Gen Z voters or just the Gen Z voter population overall. Um, but to your point about the RFK thing, I think RFK did play a, a pretty big role actually in swinging some undecided voters towards Trump's way because I know a lot of the um, I guess more I guess more like almost libertarian or, or people who aren't towards one political side really liked and really supported RFK. And I believe that a lot of them, when RFK transition, transitioned over to kind of Trump's party as a cabinet member, a lot of people were then convinced to vote for Donald Trump instead of voting for another third party candidate. Yeah. And then kind of going off voting, let's talk about polling. Um, I don't know if you guys know this, but most of the polling is conducted through like telemarketers and like just phone calls like that. And I mean, let's be honest, like looking around at like most people, especially most people our age, you're not going to be answering those telemarketers to answer who you're voting for. And we've obviously all also got those texts that like say like text this number to this number yeah. if you're voting for Kamala or Trump. Yeah. Um, do you guys really think the polling was accurate? And yeah. do you think it really reflected how the voting well, went? I mean, I, I mean, mean, I mean, we knew the polling wasn't accurate. A after the election, we were like, oh, wow, the polling really sucked this time. I mean, th the polling technically said uh, Iowa was supposed to go to Kamala. And it, that's just one of many examples where the polling was wrong. Um, to your point, uh, like I've never been asked personally to take a poll for a presidential candidate. I don't know who has, so I don't know who's answering. See, yeah, these, that's like the other thing is like these polls. I, I don't really. Yeah, hate. because well, yeah. I've gotten the the text messages on my phone that say like text this number, but I looked it up and I think one website said something like ninety percent of the polling is taken through those random digit dialing yeah. calls. And I'm like, I have never gotten one of those calls. So I don't even know how that would be accurate. Even if everybody was getting called, it seems like not everybody would even answer those type of phone exactly. calls. Exactly. I think um, in, yeah. in our generation, I think, especially with like, you get, I mean, most people, they get like a random text or phone call. They're just going to ignore it or delete it. You know? yeah. yeah. Like Even if it's not from polling, you're not going to yeah. like particularly I feel answer like that. When we get texts like that, at least people our age tend to just immediately think it's like a scam of some sort. And yeah, kind of yeah. Just disregard it entirely. Yeah, unless I'm expecting like either a phone call or a text from some specific place, uh, yeah. I just disregard any text that comes from a number that I don't know. So yeah, and then now since we have a Republican who's voted in the office and the Republicans control the majority of basically everything going on with Congress right now, do you guys think that Republican control will stay after the next four years into 2028? How do you think people are going to vote in 2028? Will the current regime kind of stay as is? And I know we talked about this. Um, I think I talked to you about this maybe last night, Evan. Um, do you think that Trump's cabinet, they're all going to run against each other as Republicans in 2028? Do you think they're all going to kind of say, hey, um, you know what, I'm going to run against you. I want to be president. Or are we going to see tickets like J.D. Vance with a vice president, Tulsi Gabbard, or maybe like RFK running with like Vivek as his vice president? Do you think they might team up or do you think they're going to run against each other? I think I honestly think it'll be a mix of both. Um, I could see where you could get like a Vance and uh, Tulsi ticket. But then, I mean, I don't know with like people like RFK. I mean, I think a lot of it might just come down to like how the next four years go. And Obviously, I mean, with how Trump's last uh, term ended, um, we, uh, we all know how that went. Yeah. Honestly, so there yeah. was some. How did that go, Evan? I don't <laughs> know what happened. A lot of uh, a lot of turmoil. So you know, I, I, it, assuming that, that this term doesn't end like that, I, I think we could see a lot more um, teaming up uh, from from the Republican uh, cabinet that uh, Trump has, as opposed to again the last one. Yeah, and then Nick, I'll ask you, um, I kind of mentioned like just like the Republican control and stuff like we know about like we like could we see like a ticket with a Tulsi Gabbard and RFK on the same ticket? But do you think that in general Republican control will stay how it is like 2028 and beyond? 
I don't really know. I mean, this election we saw a huge shift towards more Republican voting. Um, that's that's for sure. But I really can't predict four years from now what's really going to happen. To be completely honest, it might be like earlier during the Obama administration and stuff like that, we saw a large shift towards more of a left-leaning party, and it could stick for the next 10 to 12 years or something like that, and then take another shift and, and go towards Republican again. But I, I, I really don't know. Um, I really don't know if this election was more based off of people just not liking Kamala as a candidate as much or or what it really was so it's just one of those things that time will kind of tell yeah and then we also saw a, lar a large appeal to people like RFK who was a third party candidate and I don't really know if we've really seen that much support especially from Gen Z a younger audience for a candidate like that and he he wasn't really as polarizing as Trump but he certainly had some like views yeah. that were polarizing <laughs> on like the vaccines, the, yeah the vaccines yeah. and stuff like that um do you think that a third party candidate in the future would have a chance in 2028? And do you think that RFK, if he handled things a little bit differently, he could have possibly passed somebody like Trump up in this kind of election? Like, how do you think that could have worked out? And do you think a third party candidate could work out in the future? Um, yeah, you mentioned in 2028, I'll be honest, I think there's no chance a third party. Yeah, would I, was win, gonna, unfortunately. I was gonna agree. Um, a guy like RFK is, I mean, probably the most popular third party candidate at least I mean I know he, he got he took himself off the tickets and you know a lot of in like all the swing states and everything so uh, the voting numbers might not exactly show uh, and obviously him joining Trump's cabinet had an effect on that also so that might not like accurately show like how many people actually preferred RFK to Trump but I think it'll be a very long time before Maybe not even in our lifetime, honestly. I think yeah, just, yeah. I mean, I, I feel like I, I kind of had some hope with RFK just because of, like, the way he was speaking and, like, kind of his, like, appeal to young people. He also was going on these podcasts, like the Nelk Boys yeah. and everything, too. Obviously, the Nelk Boys, they're not, like, you know, like, I'm not going to listen to the Nelk Boys. Well, no, but like, it, <laughs> it does have an effect, especially with young voters. I yeah. mean, you saw Trump, you saw Trump kind of follow in the footsteps of him. He was kind of the first one to go on, like, the Joe Rogan podcast and and kind of um, market himself with a bunch of these uh, figures that had a very younger audience mm. and it, it turned out to be a super effective thing that Trump did um, and Kamala just never took advantage yeah. of I she mean, never yeah, took advantage like of going on Joe Rogan or sitting down and have it. She did the call me daddy one, but yeah, it was but only that for was an during hour the hurricane too. And like, yeah, it, that was the other it kinda, thing. Yeah. Just the situation kind of look, kind of made it look bad yeah. for her. Yeah, so. and I feel like the way she talks too, it almost looked very fabricated and planned out too. Yeah. You could kind of tell like while she was talking and obviously too, well, it was during the hurricane. And then she calls like Ron DeSantis and says, Hey, uh, can I help you out with the hurricane? And yeah. then Ron DeSantis says, you know what? I'm not even picking up your call because I have Joe Biden's direct phone number. So why would I pick up your call? And also, apparently, she didn't help out with Florida the whole time she was in office. But yeah. That's a whole another that, story. That's but. what I was talking about with the the kind of fabricate. You brought it up like when she was on that podcast, it just seemed fabricated. It, it just seemed like not who she was as a person it was like those buzzwords those political buzzwords and I, that's also to the point of why i think a lot of people connected with trump more because she was just saying oh social security we're gonna take back rights blah 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 but i mean we've heard that for so long now and people are kind of tired of hearing that and then not seeing anything yeah, and do you guys think that it's almost an expectation now that you're able to go on podcasts as, like, is it as much of an expectation as debating, like, another candidate to go on these podcasts and to seem transparent? I, I wouldn't say as much, like, an expectation, but I would say, uh, seeing as what happened, uh, you know, a couple of weeks ago, I think here on out that you're going to see more of that. I think that it definitely had a major effect. I mean, I think the debates, just because of, like, the tradition of how long go back goes back, it obviously, it almost, like, I mean, it is like an expectation, whereas like I don't necessarily know to be an expectation, but I think if you're going to expect to win, that it would definitely be a very good idea to kind of follow that lead and take take the time to uh, 
try and reach younger audiences through things like podcasts. Yeah. And before we get into some of Trump's economic policies, um, just because I thought about this just now, um, I, I feel like so I went out uh, yesterday and I interviewed some people about their thoughts on the election. And all three people I interviewed said the general feeling around campus was negative. And obviously, if you talk to like everyone here, not everyone's going to say they feel negative about it. But also, I feel like in all of the classes I've been in, it does feel like there's a little bit of an elephant in the room that no one's talking about, too, and no one really wants to talk about it. Why do you guys think that it's almost, like, uncomfortable to talk about elections like this? And is it because of Trump and the candidates? Or is, has it always been that way? Because also in 2020, we were all cooped up in our houses, too, during the pandemic, so you couldn't really necessarily feel the energy after the election. Do you think it's because we're all, like in college and we're able to vote now and that's where you're feeling the effects of it more or is it like something else i mean i think people were definitely disappointed um i'm not gonna hit on like i'm not really gonna hit on any exact political beliefs here i think a lot of people on the losing side were disappointed and and um were kind of worried about our what's gonna happen next um, because I don't know, I, I, I did kind of feel that sense of like disappointment, like the day after the election, when I went into my classes, definitely, um, a lot of people seemed worried, but the, the truth is, I mean, the president can't do as much as they think he's going to do. I mean, you, uh, sitting here and say, is Trump a threat to democracy? That's a whole nother conversation that um i'm not gonna personally have but um i don't know i think a lot of people were disappointed because the democratic party definitely markets more towards college educated young kids and i think a lot of college educated young kids were hoping and just almost assuming as if kamala was gonna get into office yeah and then kind of just like kind of a swerve here moving into trump's economic <laughs> policies according to npr and time magazine trump he wants to impose a 10 percent to 20 percent tariff on all goods imported into the united states and even a 60 percent tariff from chinese goods uh how do you think this is going to affect the economy and is that going to encourage business to stay in the united states because we're going to get be getting some money from those um or is that going to kind of deter business from staying here um, and yeah, just in general, do you guys think that those policies are going to work out? Because like even I interviewed um, Dr. Vedder yesterday. He was a political or an economics professor here at Ohio University. And he said that he has some hope for Trump's poli economic policies, especially regarding regulation cuts on things like climate change and oil and stuff like that. But he did say that like for every economist you talk to, one of them might say that the tariffs are a good thing, but then three or four more might say that they're a bad thing. So how do you guys feel about that? Yeah. So, I mean, speaking on the tariffs um, to like Chinese imported goods, I mean, there's definitely in the short term, I would say overall negative effects uh, specifically on Chinese imported goods. I mean, it, you should expect to see, uh, assuming he goes through with what he's kind of ran on, you should expect to see Chinese imported goods, the price, the cost go up. Um, but like again, like you said, um, people have different opinions. You could talk to one economist; they say one thing, another says another, kind of depending on uh, w their own views. Um, but I think, in the short term, I, I think it will cause some price spikes. But long term, I think it could have some some benefits to the economy a as a whole. Okay, and then Nick, what do you think about that? Uh, I think, in the kind of agreeing on what Evan said, I think I think short term you're going to see prices for imported products kind of spike a little bit because um, tariffs are just a tax to bring them in so um, the companies are going to try to up their prices and to be or to be able to bring their products in obviously it's going to take a while for companies to really like analyze how much money they're going to be making off off um, doing business in China and importing it versus doing business here. Um, they got to run through a bunch of numbers. So the hope is that 
um, the tariffs will bring more business back into the U.S., but it's kind of hard to tell how it will play out. Yeah. Yeah, and then do you think with these tariffs, obviously it's going to sort of maybe deter other countries from even trading certain things with us because, you know, you're not going to want to trade with someone who's like basically like taxing something that you're importing or exporting into their country. Um, and my, my dad, um, you know, my, you guys know yeah. my dad. He is, is the global sales manager for St. Cobain, and he works with China and Japan. And he actually said that some of the people in China that he works with are a little bit concerned about the tariffs. Um, that are being imposed on them. Um, do you guys think that this could start another trade war with China? And do you think that's a war we can win? And do you think that it's going to deter other countries from even trading with us? Um, I think a trade war, honestly, is probably imminent at this point uh, to some degree. Um, if we could win it or not, I mean, I think it would kind of – it's hard to say kind of beforehand. Um, it, it would just depend on, like, how things play out. I mean, I'm – most curious, I think, to see if China does, if a trade war does start, where some of these companies are going to look to um, outsource from. Uh, specifically, I know a lot of Southeastern uh, Asia countries um, will be where they're looking. But I, I think it's, it's at this point, in the early stages, it's probably a little too difficult to try and predict exactly how it would go. But I definitely think a trade war is uh, on the horizon, I would say. Yeah, and also just to correct my dad's title, I just looked it up on LinkedIn. It's the director of global <laughs> business development, not global sales. But he is involved in sales, yeah. just to clarify. I thought, yeah. like, I was like, is that his right title? But anyway, um, Nick, do you think that a trade war could be imminent? Uh, probably. I mean, if you're a businessman in China doing business in China or you're the Chinese government, um, if the U.S. puts a 60% tariff on your products, you're also going to be putting tariffs on their products. I mean, it's just reactionary. So I'm sure, I'm sure um, that some sort of altercation is going to happen. Um, the exacts, I don't know really. I mean, yeah, I, I don't really know um, in the future how long that's going to be in effect and a, we'll just kind of have to see it. Yeah. And then kind of moving to what Trump's doing right now with his cabinet. This is one of the most wild cabinets we've, we've ever seen being put together right now. You've got RFK, who is what is the director of health and human services. Something like that. Yeah. So he wants to do all these things with like food and making America healthy again, as he says. And then we've got Tulsi Gabbard, who's the director of national Intel and then we have Matt Gates. Well, he, he still has, he still has to be. There's some uh, speculation. That's the there. Fox News reporter, right? No, he, or, wait. Uh, he was a. Who am I thinking? Hold of? on, wait. We're gonna we're gonna look this the, up. But re Matt, regarding head of defense. Uh, so he is. He was he's the a, attorney general. Is what Trump had picked him for. But there's a lot of speculation as to whether or not he's actually going to be oh, like, okay. sworn in. Because there's a lot of Republicans who are in Congress that oppose him. Yeah. Will yeah. Most likely be voting against him, plus all the Democrats voting against yeah. him. So it's... Okay, so wait, I found it. So Matt Gates, he proudly, proudly represents Florida's first district in the United States Congress. And he's a Republican. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> um, let's see here. He went to William and Mary Law School and also Florida State University, apparently. And hmm, then also there's a lot of allegations I'm seeing right now yeah. just by looking him up. Yeah about um, mm -hmm. some uh, bad things I'll be honest, <laughs> that I'm reading right of, now. Of all of Trump's cabinet picks, I, I think that one is the one that surprised me the most. I yeah. think just given the background mm -hmm. and some of the things in his past for attorney general, like I, I just I didn't really understand that. Yeah, and I, I almost feel like Trump just picked them because he wanted someone in there who was going to be as outspoken as he is yeah. on certain things, and uh, maybe it would be easier I to would, would pass things. As, as attorney general, like, yeah, like... He probably looked at him and saw him saying all those things like and like, I mean, if you look him up, I looked him up last night and literally if you look up Matt Gates, I think it says Matt Gates, like crazy moments, confirmation yeah, or he, like he's, best he's, moments. So I don't know if that's if, like <laughs> if you're very like into politics on social media, he's a extremely, extremely, again, also I've used the word a lot, very polarizing, polarizing figure character. in the Republican a Party. Lot of polarizing a lot figures. of a lot of. A lot of Republicans don't like him either, which is, again, why I was so surprised why he would pick someone that a lot of Republicans don't even support. 
Yeah, and then the UFC fight on Saturday night, he literally brought all of them out there like the Avengers or something, which was like pretty funny, (laughs) to say the least. But I mean, like, what do you guys think about like RFK? Like, personally, I feel like he's going to do good things for the country, even like, I mean, like, he wants to help people. He wants to actually make people eat healthy and help people eat healthy. And even if he's not going to have, like, a huge effect, at least you have someone in there who's going to kind of, like, try to do that and maybe, like, try to get people moving in a different direction than we're in right now with food. Like, do you guys think that it's a good thing that he's in that position or no? You know, I I did like the pick from Trump uh, specifically for, like, you know, his health initiatives. Um, I just hope he doesn't take things too far. You know, he's express some like very like he seems to want to take it very far as far as re- putting regulations and i honestly i don't know like how far he could take it because when you think about what he would like be doing to these like massive corporations like even like a mcdonald's or something if he's going to go and say like you got to get rid of all this stuff like i honestly i'm not well, sure we, we saw a picture with him with mcdonald's <laughs> yeah. on a private jet <laughs> I'm, so i'm not i'm not, <laughs> he I'm not sure but he was like so sad he's like Dang, I got Yeah, he I looked like so this. like disappointed. Like, I mean, you know, Joe in Impractical Jokers, when there's that one where he's like eating the thing behind the counter, and they, they're yeah. like, Joe, look disappointed while you're eating it. I feel like that's what RFK looked like on the plane. I, I wonder if he actually ate it, if it was just for the photo op. I don't know. Maybe he, didn't, maybe he didn't even eat it afterwards yeah. because he felt so bad, maybe. But he looked like he was regretting it while he was like about but to take a bite of it. I got seed oil. <laughs> <laughs> I need the towel. Oh. I need the tallow oil. But, um, oh my gosh. He's talked about like wanting to get rid of a lot of like the fluoride in our water and stuff, which I honestly don't know about that. Um, because the whole reason it's yeah. there is to prevent tooth decay. Right. Yeah. And I'm like, if he was just going to remove all of it, I mean, what kind of effect would that have? But That's it was, intradi- teeth it was introduced yeah. during, like, the Great Depression yeah. when people weren't brushing their teeth. They yeah. didn't know anything about dental hygiene. Yeah. Hygiene. So, I, so I don't really know why they still have it in yeah. there. I feel like also that just has to cost more money, right? Like, it I has know. to cost more money to I put a chemical in the water than if you just put normal water. In yeah. some sort of way, so I uh, guess our teeth are all gonna decay. Apparently. I guess so. <laughs> We're not gonna. <laughs> yeah, I don't know the whole like supply chain process looks like for that. Honestly, yeah. But I guess we'll see. I don't know. Yeah, I guess so. And then all right. I also so, I'm I also am not a conspiracy theorist. No. Yeah. Like, no, that's what a lot back. of people but, say. Yeah, about a lot that, of that people are like the last the people like, to do it was uh, the Nazi party and yeah. The, and uh, I'm not saying I think that at all. <laughs> yeah, that's like, definitely. I'm not. <laughs> But, um, yeah, I don't, I don't know why we do that. When, when yeah, that's interesting, though. Like, that's like, an interesting point that there's fluoride uh, yeah. in the water. It just kind of makes no sense. Yeah, it's a little yeah. bit strange. I mean, but whenever I was talking about RFK, like, not taking it too far, I was kind of referring to, like, some of those conspiracy theories that he's been uh, he's been linked oh, to yeah, a lot and kind exactly. of supported. Um, yeah. So I, I mean, he was, like, was he, like, the first guest to go on the Joe Rogan podcast, which is literally, like, a conspiracy <laughs> podcast most of the time? Yeah. So, like, yeah. I don't know if that's, like, a sign yeah. of... Anything, but um, all right. So we only have about a couple minutes left in the podcast today. But my final question I would like to ask both of you guys is: Do you feel like the country overall is in good hands, and do you think we're going to be fine in the next four years, or do you think some bad things could happen? Nick, <laughs> you're making a face over there. <laughs> I don't know. That's a hard. That's kind of a hard question to answer. Um, a lot of the reactions from, like, people who obviously voted left that I see. On, also, I'm not talking about everybody. Just want to make that clear. Like, obviously, some people that you see online, that does not reflect everybody that did vote for the Democrats. But some of the things I've seen online is is kind of just wild. Like, I, I've, it's almost like, like they forgot that Trump had been in office um, before. Like, um, obviously, you're not going to be subject to Handmaid's Tale. I don't think women are going to have zero vo- zero rights or zero, anything like that. Um, I don't think it's as big of a deal as a lot of people kind of m- are making it seem, at least online. Um it's definitely disappointing if some of the, some of the um, some of the policies and stuff that you wanted to see wasn't wasn't chosen or wasn't um, preferred. But 
I think we'll be fine, yeah. honestly. So to answer that, I mean, honestly, I'd say there's like two main things that come to mind for me. First of all, I think like I could kind of see it going either way. I mean, I could see it going well. I could see it going poorly. Again, it's it kind of depends on, I mean, Trump in the past has in his first term, like, oh, Mexico is going to pay yes. for the wall. Like, how much can, you know. And he, Mexico he's lied. will pay <laughs> for the wall. He has lied in the past and not yeah. gone through with things he said. So it's, again, kind of hard to tell. It depends how much yeah, he actually Yeah, I also want to point out, I, I was, there is a, a big possibility of something weird going on. I mean, like, not to bring up January 6th again. Like, yeah, you, yeah, that's you do, like, ha yeah, you you do have, that have to take that into consideration. Yeah. So there is also a chance that, that some things will rise. I don't, yeah, so. And then to touch on how people are reacting, um, I will say I think it's kind of with every election that you see a lot of, like, extreme reactions. Yeah. I mean, obviously in 2020, January 6th, you know, um, and then before that, obviously with uh, Trump and Hillary, we saw some very extreme reactions, you know, people moving out of the country and whatnot. Um, so I think it's kind of typical to see extreme reactions, especially on social media, like Nick had mentioned, like does not represent, you know, the majority of the people who are, were actually voting that way. So I think, again, we just kind of have to see how it plays out, I guess. I mean, but I'm not surprised to see these extreme reactions um, from social media. Yeah, yeah, well, we're going to have to wait and see what happens over the next four years. But unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today's podcast. I wish we had more time <laughs> because we were really getting into some good stuff there. But Reese Thompson, she filmed her magazine show today. So that should be up online, I think, today. And I also have my own magazine show coming up in, I think, in a couple weeks after Thanksgiving. So be sure to check that out. But that is all the time we have today. So for Gen Z up to the ballot, I'm Sullivan Beach. Thank you, Nick and Evan, for joining me today. Thanks for having Thanks me. Thanks for having me, too.